Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Having It All podcast, the show about what it takes to live an abundant, loving life. My name is Matthew Bivens, and each week I'm helping you get out of your head so that you can truly have it all. Let's do it. What's up? What's up? Beautiful people. (laughs) Welcome to the Having It All podcast. I'm Matthew Bivens, and if you cannot tell, I am excited that you are here with me today to talk about having it all, an abundant, loving life. That's what we're here to discuss and dive into, and today's conversation is very, very awesome. I don't do a lot of interviews on the podcast anymore. I used to. The show actually started off as an interview podcast, and then I, uh, I, I evolved, and so the show evolved. But every once in a while, I feel inspired to bring a guest on the show, and that's what I got for you today. My conversation today is with Dr. Garland Vance. He is, among many things, he's an author, and he's put out this really powerful book called Getting Unbusy, which is all about helping you to eliminate busyness in your life. And so Dr. Garland and I, it's actually weird calling him Dr. Garland. He's a real close friend of mine. So I'm like, Dr. Garland, but he's a doctor. So Dr. Garland and I, we just dig into not just his book, because you know there's so much awesome, awesome stuff in the book, as you're going to hear. But I really wanted to hear about his story with dealing with busyness and overwhelm and feeling imbalanced and stressed out. Um, because he has a, a story that I think a lot of you all can relate to, um, a story that that landed him in the hospital with his doctor saying, hey, I'm fearing for your life. And so, you know, stuff gets real. And uh, I, I really had a great time talking to Garland, and we just dig into all sorts of cool stuff. So that's the conversation I'm bringing to you today. But let's kick things off, as we always do, with some magic. Magic and magical moments. What is that? What is that? Because there's a lot of different ways you can look at magic. Here in the context of this podcast, we talk about magic in terms of your ability to influence yourself, others, and life in an empowering way. Influencing yourself, others, and life in an empowering way. And I'm going to share three pieces of magic today. Self-magic, others' magic, and life magic. So that you can see how all this stuff comes together. And once I'm complete sharing my magic... If you feel inspired, pause the episode and reflect on some magic that you've created in your life. Think back to the last 24 hours. How have you influenced yourself? How have you influenced another person? Or how have you influenced life in in an awesome way? So my first magic is self-magic. And my magic is that for the second week in a row, I scored 100% on my balance chart, which is awesome. That uh, That is tremendously magical for me. 100% 100% completion on my balance chart tool um, is no easy task. I have a lot of stuff on that tool. Uh, but beyond performing all the habits and, and being very intentional about making time throughout the week to, to get those habits done, beyond that, the 100% is really me making a commitment to show up for myself and to show myself that, yes, when I put my mind on something, I can get it done. And so that was a major, major deposit into my tank, and that's my self-magic. Others Magic has to do with a client of mine. We had a really tremendous conversation recently. um, And I love when I'm when I'm working with clients one on one, you know, I have an agenda and and I have a plan for kind of where I want to take a conversation. And we follow a program of mine that I've developed. 
But every once in a while, we just, we go left, right? We go off on a tangent. And that was one of the conversations that we had. We went off on a tangent and we dug into something that was very, very important and very personal and very relevant um, for, for them. And so the magic was that the day after our call, I get an email and they tell me that um, not only did they get a lot from the call, but the call really inspired them to take a, a massive action in their life, which had to do with the relationship. And that to me is so beautiful, you know, when, when people like really receive and, and it, something really clicks and they make their own decision to take a leap of faith, to take massive action. So that right there was absolutely some magic that I'm, I'm very grateful I got a chance to participate in and um, experience through my client. And life magic... For me, this week, life magic um, has to do with growing my business. I put intention out there that I wanted to um, start attracting more business referrals. I want, you know, I get some referrals from my business right now, and it's fantastic. Um, and I believe that through the clients I'm working with currently, the clients I've worked with in the past, and people within my network, that I can completely surpass all my business goals simply from those connections. So I put an intention out there. Um, into the universe, and I wrote it down on uh, my to-do list of putting some energy around generating business referrals. Um, and I wake up this morning to uh, new referral emails that came into my inbox. So it's just really beautiful, um, and and just it's awesome how quickly the universe can respond. You know, you put something out there, and boom, next day, for me in this case at least, next day it showed up right there. So I love that. It just continues to remind me to have faith. It continues to remind me to trust and surrender. It continues to remind me that I don't have to get so fixated on the how. How is this going to work? How am I going to make this happen? How am I ever going to pull this off? That I don't need to get focused and fixated on those things as long as I'm staying connected to the what and the why, right? And so those are my three pieces of magic, self, others, and life magic. And again, I wanted to give you an example of what each one of those looks like. So that was me for this week. And now, if you feel inspired, pause the episode. Pause the episode and reflect on how you've inspired or influenced yourself, how you've influenced another person, or how you've influenced life to show up for you. Because you are magical. You absolutely are. And you are powerful. You're creating these magical moments all the time. But I bet you you're missing a lot of them. And so when you recognize your magic and you reflect on it and you say, wow, I really am freaking powerful, what that actually does is it helps pull you out of the victim mindset and victim mentality where you feel hopeless, where you feel at the whim of other people or the economy or your boss, where you feel like you don't have many options and you feel powerless. It pulls you out of all of that energy and all of those feelings and moves you closer to, you know what, I can create whatever I want in life. I can experience whatever I want to experience in life. Those things that I have in my mind that I call them dreams, you know what? They can actually be tangible. It can be real. And I have the power to, to create them. And so that's why we reflect on these magical moments. So go ahead and do that. Pause the episode. And then we're going to move on to listener love. And uh, I have a, a slight, I guess, deviation on listener love uh, for this week. I want to give a lot of love to everybody who showed up on last week's Purpose webinar. So last, I believe it was Wednesday, um, I hosted a webinar, How the Heck to Finally Figure Out What Your Life Purpose Is. And it was so awesome to see so many of you all sign up for this webinar and show up and participate and be engaged and interact and really think about the material and think about the questions that I was giving you because I shared my story in the webinar and I shared how throughout my years, it wasn't, you know, I had a hard time answering the question, what is my purpose? But there were other questions along the way that I was able to answer. And each one of them were like springboards that propelled me forward to get closer to really connecting with my purpose. So the webinar is all about sharing those questions with you and really coaching you on how to not only approach them, but how to answer them and then what to do with those answers. And it was so, so awesome to spend that time with you all. So for everybody who showed up on the webinar, this listener love is goes out to you. This shout out goes out to you. 
and I had some some really great responses, and um, I decided I'm going to do a another uh, webinar. I'm going to do another one on the same topic. Um, the date is to be determined, so stay tuned. I'll announce it on the podcast, but um, I'll also be talking about it on Instagram, so make sure if you aren't following me on Instagram, you go and do that, Matthew underscore Bivens. Um, that's where I'm going to give all the details about the upcoming webinar, which is really going to help you connect with your purpose. And let me tell you, some really magical things happen when you feel more clear on your purpose, when you feel more connected to it. Even if you don't fully, fully know exactly what it is, I'm going to help you move down that path. And just taking one step down that path can absolutely transform the way you experience and view, view your life. So stay tuned. We're going to have another webinar coming up. And once again, shout out to everybody who joined me on last week's webinar. Okay, I'm ready to get into this conversation with Garland. Um, we have a lot of fun. And again, he wrote, he wrote this, this incredible book called Getting Unbusy, Five Steps to Kill Busyness and Live with Purpose, Productivity, and Peace. Now, you can just tell from that subtitle, like, this is my jam. Living with purpose, productivity, and peace. I talk about those, those three things on my show all the time, all the time. So obviously, Garland and I had a lot to dig into, but you're also going to hear me um, talk, you know, hear him share his story. And I think it's his story that is, is really the inspiring part because he didn't just write a book. He, he changed his life. Like He transformed how he went about his life. And as a result of his transformation and the things that he started to experience when he made his big change... That's where the book came from. So it wasn't book first and then he worked on himself. It was, let me work on myself for many, many years, and then I'm going to write a book sharing with the world my insights. So his book is awesome, and I just want to read one little uh, one passage, just a couple sentences, that it's going to help you um, understand why this book is powerful and why Garland is the man. So he wrote, I've become convinced if you want a life of purpose, productivity, and peace— you must start with peace. You enhance purpose and productivity by extinguishing stress, overwhelm, and exhaustion. I wrote this book so you can get peace. Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience-based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAPE preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTRAININGSC.COM to inquire. So if you are currently experiencing, or if you're very familiar with the feelings of stress, overwhelm, and exhaustion, then not only do you want to pay attention to the rest of this podcast episode, but you definitely want to go out and get a copy of Garland's book, Getting Unbusy, because he absolutely helps you to create and experience peace in your life. And from that, it will help you flow into more productivity and to a deeper connection with purpose. So, with no further ado, I bring you my conversation with Dr. Garland Vance. Dr. Garland Vance, welcome to the Having It All podcast, man. How are you? I'm doing great. I am living an abundant, loving life. And so, thanks for having me, Matthew. Glad to be here. Oh, man, that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm super stoked that you're here. You and I have known each other for a number of years and um, we've had just some really magical conversations over those years on all sorts of things. And today's conversation, I'm I'm extremely excited about because we're digging into something that has been um, a, a a personal journey for me, and that's the idea of busyness and what that yeah. does to us, and and creating a life where we don't feel busy, and rather we feel peaceful and productive and purposeful. And you, my friend, are a master at that because you've recently written a book about it. So Garland, I'm excited to dig into your story. I'm excited to dig into your book. And I'm just excited to learn. I'm really looking forward to learning from you today. So thanks again, buddy. My pleasure. Glad to. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit, just give me, give us like the 10,000 foot view about what's going on in your life 
right now? Yeah, so uh, I co-founded uh, a company with my wife. So she and I are entrepreneurs. The company is Advanced Leadership. And so we help uh, leaders and teams and organizations live and lead with purpose, productivity, and peace. Uh, we live in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, where we actually chose to live. We got the, the opportunity to pick where we wanted to live, and we chose Knoxville, Tennessee, so we could be surrounded uh, by the Smoky Mountains, have three amazing kids, two of whom are teenagers, uh, and, uh, and then we also have a pet turtle. <laughs> of course. You got to round it out, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what what I've really enjoyed... Um, knowing you over these years is like where you are right now and what you've created right now and the work that you do right now, like you've, you've put in the reps on yourself to get to this point where you are teaching others about purpose, productivity, and peace. But I know that that wasn't always the case. And you even start off your book. I think it's chapter one. You start off your book with talking about this visit to the doctor that you had where a lot of stuff shifted for you. So can you talk a little bit about that doctor visit and what they, or what uh, he told you? Yeah. Yeah. So I went to the doctor, this was several years ago, went to the doctor for a routine checkup, but I was having four problems that I wanted to talk with them about. And and they were beginning to cause a lot of concern for me. Uh, The first was I was having chronic uh, debilitating migraine headaches. I was having about three migraine headaches a week, uh, and I would just have to go to bed and sleep for about 12 hours. Um, I was having exhaustion where I would wake up exhausted. I would go to bed exhausted. Uh, I was having heart palpitations where uh, I would be sitting at my desk uh, doing email, and my heart would start racing, and I would start sweating, and it it was just inexplicable. I was in good shape. and then I was having uh, this forgetfulness where I just could not remember conversations I had or, you know, really important details. And, and I was good at writing things down. And yet I would even forget about uh, really important conversations with my wife, Dorothy. So I went to the doctor and uh, his name was Dr. Tate. And I said, you got to, you know, tell me what's going on here. And, and you know, I was really concerned, uh, in, in all honesty, especially with the, the forgetfulness and the headaches. I was scared that there may be some kind of brain tumor or Alzheimer's that was happening. And so Dr. Tate said, well, Garland, tell me about your life. And I, I said, well, I, I'm busy just like everybody is, you know. And he said, well, tell me about your business. And I said, well, okay. Um, so I, I said I work 50 to 60 hours a week for um, a nonprofit, and uh, I direct this nonprofit. I had uh, helped to, to rebrand it, and so I said I work about 50 to 60 hours a week. Uh, that nonprofit works with college students doing leadership development, and so uh, I'm up late most nights, uh, uh, you know, usually after midnight, just trying to live the college student schedule. And I said, I'm also working on a doctorate. I started it a couple of years ago, and so I have to get up early to, to do that. And, and uh, that takes about 10 to 20 hours a week. And I have three young kids, um, and uh, my wife and I are helping out with some, uh, some leadership development at our church. Uh, and, um, oh, and last year my mom died, so I've slowed down a lot in the last year. And Dr. Tate, looked at me, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Garland, I'm concerned for your life. And again, I was like, oh my gosh, this is Alzheimer's. What in the world? You know, this is, this is brain tumor. What's going on? And he said, you're stressed out. And I got really upset, Matthew. I like so frustrated with him because in my mind, stress was for people who didn't know how to manage their time, uh, who didn't, you know, who, who just weren't high capacity people. And I was like, I, I, I don't feel stressed out. And he said, well, your head does three times a week. And I'm concerned for your life because you're stressed out. This stress is going to kill you. And I said, well, why am I so stressed out, doc? And he said, because you're busy. And, and I, got, I got even more angry with him because in, in my mind, I was busy. Sure. But I was busy doing all of these things that I loved to do. I loved yeah. my job. I loved my family. I loved, um, I loved all these things that I was doing. And for him to tell me that I was busy, I was like, well, yeah, I'm busy, but it's a, it's a good busy. And 
yet the the bottom line was all of that good busyness was killing me and uh, and I really had to come to the conclusion in the weeks that followed that if I don't kill busyness, busyness is going to kill me that's uh, there's parts of that that I relate to right like <laughs> because you know your body communicates. And so your body was yeah. giving you some pretty heavy signals. And when you when you went in there, so you thought maybe there was something going on tumor wise, something something physical that was off. Did any part of you relate what you were feeling physically in your body, those four things you mentioned? Did any part of you relate that to the fact that you were just working like crazy? I didn't because in, in my mind, you, you know, it's, it's funny as one of the things that I've discovered is as humans, we, we think of ourselves as omniscient and omnipotent until somebody proves us wrong. You know, we think of ourselves as if we know everything until we discover that we're wrong about something. And we think of ourselves as, you know, having as much energy uh, as the world can contain until we crash and burn. And, um, and so I just kind of viewed myself as, Hey, I'm a high energy person. I can, I can, you know, get up early. I can go to bed late. I'm doing things that I love. I'm spending time with people that I love. Um, I'm exercising, you know, and, and so I really didn't relate any of the physical problems that I was having to the, uh, to my, what I would call this, it, it wasn't so much workaholism as much as it was lifeaholism. Like I just wanted to cram so much into my life uh, that that it was it was tearing me down. But I didn't see the connection. How was all of that impacting your ability to be present in the different um, roles and the different activities that you were doing throughout the day and throughout the week? Yeah, yeah. Being present was not on my radar, and and um, and that was a big wake up. Uh, and probably a big reason for a lot of my forgetfulness is because every moment I was really thinking about the next moment and the next next moment and my task list was long. And so I was thinking about all the things that I needed to do, could do, should do, wanted to do. And, and as I was thinking about those, I couldn't be present in the moment. And that's a, I imagine like in hindsight, you look back because you said you tried to cram so much life into your life and then with the one of the results of that or one of the consequences of that was the challenge of being present to that life that you crammed in there yeah and and i think that's one of the things that that i missed out with busyness and and so many people i see who who talk about their busyness it, it, it's we we try to cram our lives so full of this good life that we actually miss out on it. Yeah, we can't. It, it's kind of, it's kind of like going to a um, like going to Disney World. I, I'm a huge Disney World fan. <laughs> yeah, and me it's too. Like man. Going to Disney World. Okay, awesome. We should go together sometime. Uh, it's like it's like going to Disney World and you're riding Space Mountain, but you're actually thinking about the dumb ride yeah and then you get off of that and you go over to the dumbo ride and you get on the dumbo ride and you're thinking about pirates of the caribbean and so you miss out on the enjoyment of life you can't even be present to life because your mind is so filled with hurry worry and scurry yeah i can relate to that as well i like that hurry worry and scurry yeah, yeah, I call those the the busyness vortex. It's the three um, <laughs> three elements that create uh, that kind of suck you into busyness. You're hurried. You got to move fast. You're worried because you're moving fast. You begin to have anxiety that you're not getting it all done. That you're not keeping up up with it all. And then that worry leads to scurry, and scurry is where our minds are just flitting back and forth you know, kind of like a trapped mouse, which just moving back and forth, trying to find a way to get everything done. And it just sucks us into busyness. Mm. What, what was happening with your relationships with your kids? You know, you work in 60 plus hours and, and uh, like one of the things you mentioned in your book is that surrounding yourself with people that add energy to you. And so yeah. I can imagine three kids at some point throughout the day or the week, you know, the, they're, they're taking some energy from you. So 
you've got all these hours going on, you're challenged with being present. What was happening in your relationship with your kids? Yeah, well, there's a, I'd say there's the, the, um, the story of things that are happening. And then there's kind of the clinical definition of what's happening. So the story of things that's happening is, um, I just didn't like being with them. They were one more obligation to fulfill. And, and yet that created so much guilt. Yeah. Of, mm. You know, these are the people that I love the most and I feel guilt when I don't want to be with them. And all that guilt does is drive us further away from the people that we love the most, you know? And, and so I, I wasn't playing with them very well. And, and the truth is I was probably speaking to them much more harshly than, than I should have spoken to anyone. And it wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't screaming at them all the time, but, but I remember frequently, you know, just raising my voice and let's go, let's go, let's go. And telling my kids, hurry up, you're, you know, you're causing us to be late. And so, so that's, you know, the story is I weren't, I wasn't treating them like the, the beautiful little human beings that they are. Uh, instead I was treating them and here's the clinical definition. I was treating them, um, with a condition called depersonalization and it's where we, uh, we are so busy and so burned out that we actually actively dislike other people, and especially the people who um, need the most from us, we begin to resent them and no longer treat them as people, but as objects or obstacles. And, and that's what I was doing with my kids, with my friends, with my family, is I really treated them as objects and obstacles. Well, I know how much your kids mean to you and, and just how you know, magical they are for, for you in your life. And so what, what, what was that doing to you um, internally, emotionally, when you would react the way that you reacted and, you know, when you were just showing up the way that you were showing up as a dad? Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the best word to describe it is, is shame. You know, it's, it's um, I think being a parent is one of the hardest jobs in the world uh, because at least in my case, it, it, so often feels like no matter what you do, it, you could always do it better. It could, you know, and yeah, so you, yeah. you really have to give yourself a lot of grace as a parent and shame stops that grace. You know, we begin to look at ourselves as, you know, not in, instead of saying, man, I really messed up that situation. We begin to look at ourselves as I'm a bad parent. I'm a bad father. And, uh, and that identity is going to shape us and cause us to act the way that we, we view ourselves. And, and so, um, that's what it was doing to me is every time I would speak to them, I would have this moment of just feeling immense shame, which then causes me to withdraw even further from them. And then when they need me again, I get frustrated and resent them because they, they need me. And so it's like this, you know, just this nasty cycle that was, was going on. And and again, all of it was from being overcommitted. Like that's, it it all stemmed not from, from bad children. I have amazing children, which is thanks to their mother. And, uh, and, you know, I just have incredible kids. And yet, um, I was angry at them all the time, not because of anything they did, but because I had packed my life so full. Yeah. I can just imagine, you know, being a, a dad. My um, Maya just turned three last week. So, you know, you do, you, you want to do, you know, provide and just create an amazing environment and just shower them with love and support and, and really be that model for them. You know, be that model for your kids. And so I can just only imagine what that was doing when, uh, you know, you found the, the patience was short, the, the, the tempers would, would flare and, and, and all of that. Um, yeah, man, that sounds yeah. like you was cooking yeah. a, a cocktail that, that, like that soup was, yeah. was cooking, man. Yeah. And, and, and it really creates this, this cognitive dissonance within us where we, we, know that we love our children and we feel love toward our children, but we don't act in love toward our Mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not just about our kids, you know, it's really about depersonalization is about anybody is I can feel loving towards you, 
Um, and, and Matthew, that's one of the things I'd say that so often gets missed when we talk about busyness and overcommitment is we are, we're not only busy doing good things, but we're often so busy because we're doing things for the people that we love. Yeah. And so this love of other people actually drives us to fill our calendars too full. Totally. And well, one of the things that we'll get into in a minute is there's a lot of um, habits and different things you talk about in the book that are really about connecting with yourself yeah. and, and yeah. you know, bumping yourself up that priority list at least a couple times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, I, and I really love that because I, I've experienced that um, in the work that I do as well, that you just put everybody mm. else first. Um, I'm curious. Yeah. How was your relationship with Dorothy impacted? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because Dorothy and I have always had a, a really strong relationship and a, and a really good marriage. We haven't gone through a lot of significantly challenging times in, in our marriage, but the closeness that is normally there wasn't there. We were we were further away from each other. Um, and, and, you know, when you have young kids, so much of the parenting life feels like you're just trying to coordinate the chaos. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think we were we were feeling that. But, um, you know, we're, we're just running around and trying to get our kids to the, the, the places that they need to go. And she was working. And so, you know, we didn't have an, a, a that, and that was another thing that was so crazy is we didn't have a really overcommitted family uh, time, you know, our kids weren't involved in a, in a huge amount of activities, but they were involved in enough to, to, to make it a little bit crazier for us. And, um, and so it, I would say that our marriage didn't suffer, but if we would have continued, uh, in for another two years, three years, four years, uh, it, it would have, it would have had absolutely devastating effects on us because we would have eventually burned out and, and resented each other. Um, and, and, you know, but for the grace of God, you know, it is, uh, we, we were, we were saved from a tragedy. Yeah. It sounds like you both were able to, uh, at least individually weather, you know, the storms of all the stuff that was going on. Um, do you feel like you guys were able to pour into each other in the way that, either you wanted to, or maybe the way that you are able to now, now that you've really worked on your busyness and by pour into each other, I mean, intimately, sexually, emotionally, like pour into that partnership of you and your wife, you know, because that's the, the, the heartbeat of the family. So what, what was, what was happening there? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, uh, the, the pouring into was not happening at the level that, that it is now and the level that it could have been and, and should have been uh, at that time when, you know, you, when you don't have time for the people you love the most because you're doing things for the people you love the most, then you're, you're human, you're a human doing and not a human being. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so I would say we were spending a, we were spending a lot of time together. We both worked for the same nonprofit. We, um, you know, I mean, we, we traveled together for work, but so much of our lives was concentrated on the stuff we had to do and not the people who we were with and including each other. Um, and we've talked a lot. Uh, you know, I, I um, it was in uh, 2015, I was working with that nonprofit and they went through an organizational restructuring and, um, and my, uh, I lost my, uh, my job there. My position was eliminated. And, um, and that was, uh, for us, that was part of, um, a a time where we were able to go, you know what, let's push a hard reset on everything. We had already started getting unbusy, but then this was our time to, this became a time for us to, to really, uh, change the way that we lived our lives. And it's been crazy because Dorothy and I talk a lot that, uh, we loved working together, still love working together, but we would not go back to the way things were because we were spending so much time pouring into other people that we weren't pouring into ourselves. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. I mean, one of the things that you talk about in the book is, is purpose and that feeling of fulfillment and, and, you know, pouring into others all day long to where the, you're just so 
to so stretched thin and burnt out and overstressed and all that, it's tough to at the end of the day feel fully fulfilled and and peaceful with everything when you just you've got nothing left in your tank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you are totally empty, and then you're trying to pour into the people you love the most. It's tough, tough. Lucky Land Casino asking people, "What's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky?" Lucky in line at the deli, I guess. Ah, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. All right, man. I want to switch yeah. gears. I want to talk about. You know, we painted the picture of where you were at and and all the things that were going down. You had that appointment with Dr. Tate and you said a couple months later, you were like, if I don't kill business, business is going to kill me. So where did you begin? What was what were some of the first things that you did to really work on this busy life that you had created? Yeah, it's, it's you know, I wish that it was neat and orderly uh, like the book is. The book is <laughs> yeah. neat and orderly because I studied it and I researched it and I helped other people implement it. And my journey wasn't quite so neat and orderly. Um, but honestly, the first thing that I had to do was I had to decide. I had to, say, I had to really put a stake in the ground and say enough is enough. I am not going to lay my life on the altar of busyness. And, um, and so th- that was really the first thing that I had to do. And we had to have hard family conversations and saying, okay, how are we going to slow down? How are we going to um, get some margin and space into our life? Um, I, I really started doing, there's a couple of things that I started doing almost immediately. Uh, one is, is um, a, a little simple stress test. And, uh, and I learned this from a guy named Dr. Archibald Hart, but if, if your fingertips are colder than your neck, if you put them up against your neck, uh, particularly up against your jugular vein, and um, if your fingertips are colder than your neck, then that's a, uh, there's a high likelihood that you're stressed. Uh, mm-hmm. And that means the adrenaline and the cortisol have stopped the blood flow from your extremities. And so one of the first things that I started doing is I just started paying attention to my body and in particular my cold fingers and, and I started noticing you know how often I was feeling stress and so when I would do that I would just stop for a few seconds and do some deep breathing and and re- you know normally like 10 seconds to 30 seconds not a whole lot um, but just becoming aware of stress was a huge uh, wake-up call for me and I would say you know in the beginning my fingers were colder than my neck probably 90 to 100 times a day. Um, just a, an immense amount of stress that was going uh, through me. And the other thing that I did, and this, this was a really hard change, um, but it was, uh, it, it's still, to, in my mind, one of the most important practices is I started taking one day completely off from all work. And by work, I don't mean my job. Uh, I mean, anything that felt like an obligation. And I just started taking one full day off and it would be from Saturday evening until Sunday evening. And um, that was uh, that was a huge shift for us. uh, But it gave us space for rest and relationships and recreation and reflection. And as we did that, we began to realize, huh, we can actually get six days of work. Uh, seven days of work finished in six days, and maybe this slowing down thing is is possible. I love that. I, I love just being intentional about taking that time off. And um, are you still doing that the one day a week? I am, you know, and it's still for me because I'm I'm a high achiever. It is still. I have to convince myself <laughs> of it almost every week. It's challenging. Um, in fact, yeah, it's it's super hard. This. This week, I did something uh, that I've never done before, but uh, my, I could tell that my phone was causing so much uh, anxiety with me with Facebook pop-ups and text messages. And, you know, it was just this constant uh, barrage of messages that were coming in. And so I just went to my family and said, hey, on Saturday at 6 p.m., 
I'm turning my phone off and I'm, I can't respond to text messages. I can't, you know, it's done. I'm, I got to take a break from this. And it was amazing to me how much within an hour, my mind was clearer because I didn't have all these other inputs coming in. I get it. Those technology cleanses, it's, you, you know, you, we don't really realize what that does to us until you, you step away from it. You yeah. know, until yeah. you step away from I, social I will media. Happily, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll start doing that more, more frequently because it, it has, uh, it, it just the benefits were so great. Yeah. With, uh, with the clients that I work with, we use a tool called the balance chart and oftentimes I'm putting a habit on there of a technology cleanse, either mm. beginning your day with no technology. Cause you know, a lot of folks jump on, wake up right on the phone, social media, email, yeah. all that. Um, so either beginning the day with no technology or doing a full cleanse throughout the entire day of, you know, maybe it's social media or like in your case, you know, just, just no phone in general. And it's, it's powerful, man, but you know, it reveals the attachment, you know, like the attachment oh, yeah. that we have. Absolutely. To, I need to be connected. I need to know what if, what if this happens? What if these fires, I got to be the one to put them out, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of the things, uh, Dorothy said to me, we're both Florida Gator fans. I know you're a, a, a university of Florida grad and <laughs> yes, sir. She, she was like, Hey, who, who won the game? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. And it was, it, Right. And it, it just felt so weird. And so it wasn't until the, the whole thing was over that I was like, oh, OK, yeah, they won. Whew. OK. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, it's like one of the fears. I'm going to miss out on all of this, inf- like all this stuff. I'm going to miss out on everything. But yeah. I mean, you you had a, a probably a magical day just being present. Um, I even saw in your book, one of the things that you don't do is like yard work or, or housework, yeah. like stuff no. like that. Yeah. And yeah. just that. F- yeah. Allowing. And it's, it's anything that, it, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Continue. You go. I was going to say it's, it's really anything that you deem as work. Like I have a friend who loves getting out in the yard and, and for him, you know, taking a day off and getting out in the yard is a great way to spend the day. For me, yeah. it's miserable, but I'd love to go on, on a hike. I'd love to, to read a book. Um, you know, it's, it's really what is work for you and, and learning how to, to say no to those things that are work for you. So you mentioned um, a minute or two ago, you talked about uh, recreation, rest, relationships, reflection. So you talked about the yeah. the, the core four. Can you dig into yeah. those a little bit more and uh, and kind of unpack them a bit? Yeah. So as as I was going through this journey, I was also working on my doctorate. And so uh, it's a doctorate in leadership and spiritual formation. And so I decided uh, that I would actually do my research and my dissertation on busyness and its effect on leaders. And, um, and one of the big ahas that I discovered in that was, um, was what I call the core four that you just referenced. Uh, The core four is, uh, relationships, recreation, rest, and reflection. And I call them the core four because what I discovered is the most purposeful, productive, and peace-filled people actually make those the foundation of their schedule. Uh, in other words, when they're doing their calendar planning, they're actually planning and scheduling rest, relationships, recreation, and reflection, they plan those things first, and then they build everything else around it. Uh, Instead of trying to fit those into the nooks and crannies of their calendar, when busy people don't have any nooks and crannies. And and so that that has been a, a game changer for me and for so many other people to begin saying, this is how I'm going to organize my life around these four things and then make everything else fit around them. How does that actually look in your life? It's Monday when while we're doing this, so uh, while, while we're recording this conversation. So like, how are you building those four into your week this week? Yeah, so this week I've got a pretty amazing, epic way that it's happening. It's not usually this uh, this awesome. But uh, on Thursday, I fly out to Montana to spend five days with some of my best friends from college. 
and go, uh, cool. we are, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna hike, we're gonna hang out together. And, um, and so there, there's rest. I'll be sleeping in while I'm there. There's relationships, people who are really important to me. There's recreation. We'll be, we'll be hiking. Uh, and I'm sure I don't have it scheduled, but I'm sure there will be some reflection on important things in life while I'm out there in, in the beauty of the world. Um, typically what it looks like though, is I, um, as I'm, I, I try to get a couple of weeks ahead so that I know that I'm scheduling this. So at the end of every month, I look ahead to the next month and I go, okay, where are the pockets of time where I can build intentional rest and recreation, uh, reflection and, and reflection. I kind of build that into a week. Uh, there's a weekly rhythm that I have for that. But that's what it typically looks like for me is I try to schedule it a few weeks out so that I know I have it and I can build everything else around it. So it would look like you you like sit down, open up your calendar, and you look ahead and you say, okay, in this upcoming week, I see that I have some time here. Do you say, all right, I'm trying to get all four of these things in my week or are you looking at your upcoming week and based on what you've got coming up, you look at maybe one of the core four that you're really going to, that's going to be most effective. Like what, what is your process going through this? Because I know folks listening would like to start implementing these core four and I want it to be yeah. as simple and straightforward, like do this basically. Yeah. So I want right, to, I want right. to know kind of what is your thought yeah. process? So I try to get all four in, uh, in a week. I, I do want to make sure that I get all four of those in a week, but you can combine those, right? So, uh, so I would say uh, recreation and relationships. If I go on a hike with Dorothy in the Smoky Mountains that we live by, then that's recreation. It's doing something for the sheer enjoyment of doing it, and it's relationships. And while we're there, we can also have an intentional conversation if we want to and build some uh, reflection into that. So for me, I do try to get all four of those in, but that doesn't mean that I have, you know, four, four hour blocks of time where I'm doing that. Yeah. Reflection for me is, is two minutes every night before I go to bed. I ask myself, what happened today? You know, just kind of go through the day. What am I grateful for? And what did I accomplish today? And the accomplishment question is really to help me uh, remind myself what I, what I did accomplish because busy people tend to see all the things they didn't accomplish instead of the hundred things that they did. Yes. That's one of my, uh, one of my things, man. That's one of my big challenges. And, uh, I'm yeah. actually gonna, I'm gonna ask you for some coaching at the end of this conversation. Okay. So I'm gonna put yeah. a, I'm gonna put a flag on that one. Um, cool. I love the core four. It reminds me of, of, um, back when I read Stephen Covey, like talk about big rocks and time blocking. Yep. And I'm, I'm a huge believer that if you want to feel fulfilled and, and, and be living into your purpose and just at the end of the week, end of the day, just be able to rest peacefully, that you've got to make sure those most important things are, are taken care of and not the most important work tasks, but the relationships, you know, the yeah. recreation, like getting out and, and, and doing something and play and, resting and yeah. then reflecting I, I just believe you got to be proactive in scheduling those things because you're right if you wait and you just say well i'll get to it you never will get to it like how many of us are walking <laughs> yeah. around with with just extra hours no it's like yeah. it, it always gets filled with something so um yeah. i love that you are so intentional as uh, to to in, in putting those things in your schedule um and then building everything else around it that's i love it hey thanks man Thanks. Um, so I'm I'm a, I'm real big on habits. That's one of the things that I talk about on the show and just in my life, examining my habits, reconstructing habits that are no longer serving me. Um, and you right. talk about habits as well. You, you talked about uh, in your book two bad habits that keep you trapped in overcommitment. Yeah. Can you talk about what those yeah. are? Sure. So the first habit that keeps us trapped in overcommitment is what I call we default to yes and defend to no. And what that means is when somebody asks us to do something or when we have an idea about something we should do, the gut reaction is to say yes to it. And the only reason, the only times that we don't 
uh, is if we say no, we try to defend that no and say, well, you know, I've got something that's already scheduled there, or uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit too busy. And every time we do that, we defend our no, it actually opens up the opportunity for somebody to say, uh, well, here, let, you know, let's overcome that, that problem so that you can say yes. And so I, I talk about the need to, to change that bad habit of defaulting to yes and defending to no. Instead, we want to default to no and defend to yes. So default to no means we make no our default answer. I mean, it's almost, it becomes a gut reaction almost that somebody asks you to do it. And internally, at least you say, probably not going to do that. And then you actually defend your yes. You take a little bit of time to decide, is this something that I actually want to do and can do? And, um, and if I can do it, is there something that needs to come off my schedule in order to, to um, make that happen? And so it's, it's defaulting to no and then giving a defense for our yes, put the burden of proof on the yes. That's the, the first habit. The second one is uh, about uh, the bad habit is we live this boundaryless existence. And what I mean by that is we don't build any strong boundaries around when, when work starts and when work stops and when our job starts. I'm not just talking about work, uh, you know, at our jobs, you know, when does our job start? When does our job stop? And when does work at home start? And when does work at home stop? And so the need for building strong boundaries in our lives, and that was actually one of the best uh, practices that Dorothy and I developed when we first started doing this is we realized that the, there was always more to do and we couldn't get it all done. And so we built what we called an end of day boundary. And that end of day boundary was at 9 PM. It doesn't matter if we've done everything that we wanted to do. The day ends, the, the yeah. work ends. And, and so it just kind of created this line in the sand. And what's crazy with it is uh, because of uh, what's called Parkinson's law, uh, which says work expands to fill the time allotted. Mm -hmm. So the tighter we draw our boundaries, the more work we can typically get done because we uh, because we have a stop time and we know, OK, I got to end. So so we created um, end of day boundaries and we also created work day boundaries where I would say by 515, I'm done. Uh, it doesn't matter if I have another hour of work to do. It doesn't matter how many interruptions I have. I can't do everything today. And so, you know, at 515, work ends. And uh, so those boundaries, replacing this boundaryless existence with good boundaries has uh, is a game changer for your habits. How did you guys hold those? Because it's one thing to say I'm going to stop by nine. It's another thing to actually stop as opposed to be like, well, I just, I just need like three more minutes or no, 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 this is important. This is only going to happen this one time. I need to work on that. How did you guys actually maintain right. that boundary? Yeah, we had to be pretty vigilant in the beginning. Uh, we would set an alarm uh, for uh, 8.50 p.m. Uh, so that when the alarm went off, we could look at each other in the eye and say, we got 10 minutes. That's it. We got 10 minutes left. What, what do we need to do in the next 10 minutes to set us, ourselves up for success? And sometimes it was, you know, just driven by the demands of, the, of, of young kids and saying, well, you know, th this child needs uh, to get their PJs on. And so that's what, what we need to do uh, right now. But it became a, um, a commitment that we made to each other where and that's what really, I think, strengthened it, you know, just like a commitment that you make to somebody else when you, when you commit to exercise um, and you don't want to disappoint that person, that became for us uh, what it was. And, and we didn't do it perfectly. I mean, there were definitely times where I was, where I said, Hey, can I have, can I have three more minutes? But even then what it did is it didn't stretch to 20 more minutes or 30 more minutes or another hour. It was, Hey, if I can just have three minutes to wrap this up, that'll be it. And so the commitment was still there even if we needed a little bit of wiggle room around the time. Mm. No, I like that. I mean, just, and we, and it, yeah. Cause just holding those boundaries, say, if, if it's, I, it's so important. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say, if I remember correctly, we had a five minute 
we would give each other a max of five minutes. Like that uh, wasn't, it wasn't where somebody would say, can I have 20 more minutes to work on this? No, no, no. If you need five extra minutes, that's okay. But anything more than that, that's, that's way beyond our boundary. That's awesome. You know, you got to make it realistic while at the same time, you got to hold it. You know, that's, yeah. that's how the shift yeah. happens when, when you hold it and it's uncomfortable to hold it, but that's where the growth is. So I love it. Yeah. Um, man, there's so much, I'm like, God, I wish we had, you know, we could talk for hours on this stuff because, um, <laughs> this is, it's, it's, it's practical. It's, it's straightforward. And you've really, really, you know, done your work to create this book, um, just to create this manual. So, Maybe we'll do some other conversations. I could see that happening. Hey, but, uh, I, I love that. I do want to get a chance for you to put your coaching hat on because I got some stuff I want I want to get your feedback on. Okay. For me, one of my current challenges is – there's layers to this, man. But it's, one, it's the feeling of not doing enough. Mm-hmm. Not doing enough. And so what happens with me is – I will try to fit in more things in a way to try to overcome that feeling of not doing enough. Or no matter how many things I have and no matter how many things I check off my list, I can still feel like I'm not doing enough. And then it's Mm -hmm. easy for me to push past my nighttime boundary or it's easy for me to, uh, you know, to, to, to work beyond what I said I was going to do in a day or work late into the night. So if I was one of your clients and I just came to you like, man, I just, I really struggle with this story that I have of I'm not doing enough. And how, what feedback would you give me around that? And and, um, how would you help me to, to work on that? Yeah. So I would say two things. If if you were my coaching client, the the first is that I would want to address with you uh, the the three biggest inhibiting beliefs that drive us to busyness. Um, And those, those three beliefs are, I need to be more, I need to do more and I I need to get more. Um, And and it's the first one that I think most people feel, but they uh, feel very deeply, but they don't even know that they feel it. And it's this, if I don't accomplish everything, or if I don't live up to my own expectations, then I am not enough. Mm-hmm. And we've really got to, I, I would want to work with you on the first, that inhibiting belief, because it's the belief that I need to be more that drives us to, I need to do more. Yeah. Um, that'd be the first thing that I would talk about. And then the second thing that I would if I were coaching is, is I would say, um, build in two minutes every night just to, uh, answer the question, what did I accomplish today? Uh, and to be able to take just a, a minute to look back. And because the answer to that question, uh, is, is rarely the, just the tasks that we do, you know, it's the people who we had conversation with. Uh, conversations with and the the big moments that we uh, we had and sometimes it's the the stuff that we actually got done Um, but it's taking a moment to reflect on what we actually accomplished that creates gratitude there's actually been a lot of research around this Um, it drives us to gratitude and then we begin seeing what we did do and that becomes bigger than all the things that we didn't do Mm. Uh, so those would be two things that I would say are really critical if you are struggling with not feeling like you did enough on a regular basis. I think those are powerful, especially um, those those three questions, be more, do more. And uh, what was the third one? The third is get more. So get it's about, more. Um, yeah. yeah, get more. I need to acquire more stuff or I need to have more experiences. Yeah, yeah. I, I can absolutely identify with um, the first two. And I love the suggestion of just two minutes of reflection. Um, I have a, a gratitude practice, which has been more on the informal side, I would say. It's, uh, it's a dinner time gratitude practice where, you know, we, we share what we're grateful for. It hasn't, and, and it's great, and I love it, and it's, it's been a beautiful thing to, uh, to, to instill in Maya to the point where she reminds us if we haven't said it yet. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that's powerful. Yeah, it, it, it's been amazing. Um, and I know for myself, the habit um, of sitting down and reflecting with a pen and a, and a piece of paper um, goes a long way for me. So cool, man. All right. I, I like I like those two things, and uh, I'll probably be picking your brain a little bit offline about them a bit more. Sweet. Awesome. Garland, dude, this has been a, a pleasure. Please share where folks can get the book, um, and if you've got any next step for the person who just who, whose curiosity has been piqued by this conversation, what can they do next? Yeah, so I'd say there's a there's a couple of things that they can do. If they're interested in the book, you can find it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Books A Million, uh, any online retailer. Uh, it's there. It may not be in physical uh, bookstores near you yet, but uh, that's certainly a goal uh, to, to get there. Um, and typically, the best thing they can do is is look up the name Garland Vance. Because my my title is a little funky. It's getting without a G at the end and unbusy, and there's parentheses around un. Um, and so look up Garland Vance and you can find uh, find the book. Um, I'd say if you're you're interested, if you're peaked and you're not ready to uh, to buy a book, you can go to gettinunbusybook.com. That's getting without a G at the end, unbusybook.com, and uh, find out more there. Um, I have uh, plans for the the next few months of launching a 30 day challenge course so that we can establish a community of people who can get unbusy together. But uh, I can only do so much in a day, and so I'm I'm <laughs> going at my I'm going at, at an unbusy pace. It's, uh, Beautiful, got to be it, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That you you have to live the message, and hmm. so I'm moving at a slower pace uh, than I would. Uh, naturally do and yet I'm I'm able to, to maintain my my integrity in the midst of doing that that's one of the things that I appreciate about you and that inspires me about you Garland is uh, I've known you for for a number of years now and uh, I feel like I knew you in your busy period and yeah. I've yeah I you know I've, I, I, I knew you when you were working with that nonprofit and taking on the projects and moved to go work at a different place and now you you have as you said in the top of the episode um, you and your family have have chosen very intentionally to move yourselves to this to where you are are rooted right now um, so that you can be experiencing your core four so that you can be experiencing the life that you want with the peace, the purpose, the productivity, all of it. Um, and it's been very cool to watch you really put in the work on yourself um, and then do the research and and put everything in such a, an organized way um, in your book to share with everybody else. So I'm grateful that you put in the hours and put in the love into writing this book. Um, I am getting so much from reading it, and I highly, highly recommend that everybody listening uh, who feels like their life has been busy and, and, and feel like you have that relationship towards busyness that isn't necessarily serving you, um, that you pick up a copy because Garland has really written a manual um, and made it a very simple to follow. So Garland, you're the man. I'm, I just, I, I love talking to you, man. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Matthew. Thanks for having me here. And, and thanks for being you and for being so awesome authentic and for all of the ways that you're helping people uh, have an abundant, loving life. I love my life. I feel like I have an abundant life and you're, a, you're one of the reasons for that. So thanks, man. Quick note about the Having It All podcast. I am not a doctor nor a licensed therapist. I'm a guy with a story and a passion for conscious conversation. My thoughts, opinions, and beliefs are my own. So please consult with your doctor or healthcare provider regarding any questions or issues you have related to your personal, physical, or mental health. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.